It's always very impressive that there are so many people who are interested you know, in this world, certainly tonight in Bangkok, what could you have been doing here? So many things going on in Bangkok that you could have been doing, but you know, this, this call, this idea of training the mind, of finding that point in the mind where you can put aside desires, this is really something special. And I'm always very uh, happy and impressed that, that this interests people. The Buddha himself said that there are gods and men who when they hear about putting an end to desire, their hearts do not respond. And so, certainly in Bangkok this is true. We can, you know, we put out the adverts, but on the way here, we had this joke a few years ago, we were doing some events at the Tavana Hotel, and you have to walk past Pat Pong, and we were just wondering how many people complete the walk all the way into the hotel. So, this idea of putting an end to desire, you may have heard of the Four Noble Truths. Many or most of you have uh, some experience in Dharma, some experience in meditation. And there are these Four Noble Truths, the Noble Truth of Suffering, and the Noble Truth, the Arising of Suffering, which is desire. And then the path incorporates coming to the end of desire. So what does that even mean? Can you come to the end of desire? Have you tried it? I tried it once, I didn't get very far. <laughs> we had an all-night sitting and I sat on a mat and I made this determination that I was just going to sit on the mat and have no desires. And then it's like, well, he's sitting on the mat, is that a desire? I'm like, have I failed at the first obstacle? And then I want to change position, I'm like, is that a desire or is that going to save my legs? And then, of course, after an hour it's like, I want the bathroom, and I'm like, is that a desire? I'm like, how does it work? How how is it possible even to come to the end of desires? It doesn't even sound logical. And many of these teachings don't work very well if you contemplate them kind of externally. If you hold them as principles to try and live your life by, they're not really going to work very well. To be without desire, you're not going to get by very well in the world. Your kids get up and need feeding and you're like, well, it's just a desire, leave them. Be free of desire, and you, you kids are going to get starved, and you're going to go to prison. So you can't actually maintain these kind of teachings in that way. All of these teachings are supposed to be practiced internally. And internally they can be practiced, they can be maintained, uh, and they start to provide insights and um, change the way that you live, change the way that you get by in the world. So this idea of controlling your desire, how does that actually work internally? That's what we're going to focus on for the first part of today. We'll do the meditation halfway through, and then we finish off with the second part of meditation. Uh, you may remember last week I mentioned there are two kinds of meditation. One is the emptiness forms of meditation, and the other is the stabilization forms of meditation. So putting an end to desire, is, uh, is this a worthy pursuit? When you see things on the news like all this stuff going on in Iraq and these uh, communities being persecuted and, and driven out and I don't know about you but I don't understand the problems. I, I don't know if it's good people against bad people or if it's bad people against bad people but one group is getting the upper hand so they look worse. My own opinion and I wouldn't like to try and defend this opinion, but my own opinion is that I think most people are actually good. I think most people want to be good. I think it's a small minority that are actually driving these kinds of things. And there's not very much we can do about it. I don't know what to do about it. According to Buddhism, the root causes of all of the ills in the world are not politics, are not land, not water, but the root causes are these three, greed, hatred, and delusion. And according to Buddhism, and myself, I think I agree with this, is if we're actually going to try and make a difference in the world, maybe there are things you can do for Iraq, or maybe there are things you can do for starving people. I think charities and charitable works are great things, but they're always not addressing this root cause. So according to Buddhism, the root cause is the greed, hatred and delusion 
in people's hearts. So this is in your heart and my heart. So the one thing that we can do is start this process of purifying ourselves of these qualities. We can do that. That's something that we can do. That's somewhere where we can start and somewhere where we can have an effect. The Buddha himself, if you know the history, lived by this uh, ideal. You may know he was a prince in a small fiefdom. They were actually under the power of a, a larger local state. And towards the end of his life, there became a, a fight between his kingdom or the kingdom of his family and the local state, which actually controlled the area. And what had happened was the, the big king in the area had demanded from the Sakyan clan a princess to marry because the Sakyans had a very pure Aryan bloodline and this was highly valued. So the Sakyans had sent a princess over and her father was a prince in this lineage, but her mother was a slave woman. And so when the king found out about this, uh, he felt duped, so he decided that that's worth sacrificing thousands of lives, and he attacked with his armies. As his armies attacked the Buddha's home kingdom, the Sakyan kingdom, the Buddha went and sat between these armies in order to separate them. And three times the armies came together and then seeing the Buddha, they felt ashamed and they, they retreated. And then on the fourth day, they still came to fight with each other and the Buddha didn't come out. He said, well, this is the karma of the people. And so, in fact, his home kingdom got destroyed because they were smaller and they lost the battle. Historically, it's possible that they reformed their kingdom uh, several miles away. This is the two Kapilavastus that you can find in India and Nepal. One theory is that one was the old capital and one was the new capital after they'd been defeated. So this battle has been lost in history now. You know, we don't really know very much about it. People haven't heard about it. All those people have died, passed away, been reborn, died, passed away again. But the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching has actually stayed with us through all of that time. So it seems to be that he was right. The work that you put into battling greed, hatred and delusion is something that is longer lasting and has a deeper, longer benefit on the world than the politics of the area and battles which come and go uh, in local politics. So I don't know if that's true, that our endeavours here to put aside our greed, hatred and delusion, are we going to change the world? Are the history books going to record the 60, 70 people that came together at DMG one night? Maybe, you never know. But I think that as human beings, we can try to come together in the name of what is good and what is peaceful and try to influence each other, try to encourage each other, at least for a little while. Now, I know that many of you probably will finish from here and go to the Iron Ferry and carry on. <laughs> Yeah, a few of you laughing, I know who you are. Yeah. But I think we're doing something good and we're doing something worthy. These three qualities, greed, hatred and delusion, are uh, worth investigating. There's a reason why there's only three of these qualities. First quality, greed, lopa or kwam lop in Thai. And lopa means that you focus your mind onto the things that you like. So usually people who have this kind of personality trait are forward-looking people. They're always looking into the future and looking into what they want to get, what they want to attain, what they want to have. And this is a, an, almost an obsession or this is a way of stimulation. We like the stimulation of thinking about things that we like, things that we want to get. A few years ago we had this Dhamma talk with Ajahn Pasano. It was in the Intercontinental Hotel. And I found a friend of mine who works in the Intercontinental. And I said, hey, you live here, there's no excuse, come down for Ajahn Pasano's Dharma talk. And he said, oh, I can't make it tonight, I'm, I'm busy. And I said, busy doing what? And he said, I'm just busy. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, we're going to see Avatar. <laughs> I said, come on, you can go to the cinema any time. You know, today is the only chance. Ajahn Pasana is only here once a year. And he said, yes, but Bante, it's in 3D. 
I said, like, Ajahn Pasana was in 3D as well. You come. <laughs> but the excitement, you know, something new, something exciting is always very alluring. And this is that greed. It's not really greedy, lopa. The word lopa means that we like, we like to spend our time preoccupied with things that we like, things that give us a, a pleasant feeling, a pleasant vedana. Uh, the second one of these then was, uh, we always translate as hate, uh, tosa, uh, or uh, dosa, or entire tort. And this hating is the opposite. This means you like to put your mind onto things that you dislike. And so I'm like that. I like to think of things that I don't like. I like to fix things. I always think of, you know, I get stuck in Bangkok traffic and start drawing plans for new trains and trams and things like this. And I even have drawings and things that one day when I'm famous, I can take to the government and see, I've solved all the Bangkok traffic problems. The trouble is that you become what you think. I don't know if you've heard this kind of saying that, that is in one of the... Christian Gospels that wasn't in the Bible, uh, he said, as your bodies are the food that you eat, so your being is the thoughts that you think. And this is kind of true. You can't think thoughts and not become identified with them. This is one example years ago when I, was, I came to Thailand and we had these kutis, which is the, the monks' huts, and they're raised about two and a half, maybe less, maybe like a, about a meter or so just so that when it floods, the water doesn't come up through the building. And so all these huts around, a couple of feet above the ground, make nice, cool, shady places for the many thousands of chickens that also lived on the place. So I'd have my meal, I'd eat my arms food, and I'd get back to my room, and it's boiling hot, it's 40 degrees, there's no air conditioning, you know, it's, it's in the rainy season, it's so hot and humid that you can't even feel your breath. You're not even sure if you're still alive or not in the afternoon. And you've got one meal a day. That's your only pleasure for the day is this one meal. And you f you filled yourself up. So then you lie down on the floor because there's no beds. So you're lying down with your ear on these thin floorboards, just drifting off into a little bit of respite. And then the chickens crank up six inches from your ear through the floorboard underneath the huts, you see. And this drove me crazy. I felt that 10, 15 years as a vegetarian, all the chickens' lives that I've saved, I think they owe me something. <laughs> and <laughs> I have a right to not be disturbed by the chickens, you see. And they'd screech and I'd go crazy. And I don't know what the Thai monks were thinking. They must have thought I was a bit mad. But I just got really wound up and re really crazy with these chickens. I was stalking around the undergrowth, undergrowth, looking for them like this. And then they hide quite quietly. And every time I find one, I'd kind of jump on it and flap around and scare it off. And then it occurred to me, you become what you think. And I realized that I bug eyed, my head's bobbing around and I'm flapping my arms in the undergrowth. I'd actually become a chicken. And so the thoughts that you pull up in your mind, are, this is what start to become your personality. This is why with uh, vampires. They say if a vampire bites you, you become a vampire. Vampires represent our unwholesome qualities. If you call a vampire in, you know vampires can't get into your house unless you invite them. You know that. These aren't just crazy little storylines. These are actually real things that happen with our internal qualities. So when you have a bad quality, you have to invite it in somewhere within you. And once you invite it in, you can't be a good person but have that bad quality. So this kind of hating mind, you can't call, you can't have it and entertain it, but still be a good person. So the greed, the hatred, the hatred is always, uh, or the dosa is, you like to spend your time thinking about things that you dislike. And this is problem solvers have this kind of mind. The third kind of mind is the delusion, moha. And delusion means not they have a crazy viewpoint that doesn't agree with me, because that's what most people think. Everyone else is deluded. Delusion in Buddhism means you spend your time being stimulated by things that don't really matter. So it's not things that you like or you dislike, but you just like to lose your sense of consciousness. 
the best example used to be TV. Turn on the TV, you know, they had people sitting in a room doing nothing. And then they had other people sitting in a room watching TV. And it turns out watching TV burns fewer calories than doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> These days, another example is people looking at their phones on the SkyTrain. I mean, it's like fubbing on the SkyTrain. <laughs> It's like you can't spend more than five minutes with yourself without having some kind of entertainment, some kind of stimulation, something to pull your attention away from yourself. So all three of these, these greed, hatred and delusion, is a form of stimulation. You're looking for stimulation to keep you interested, to keep your attention outside of yourself or away from yourself. Stimulation either with things that you like, you dislike or that you feel neutral about. That's why there's only three of these qualities. So, what is the alternative? The alternative is train yourself to be back with yourself. Instead of having your attention sucked away, having your attention sucked outside of yourself, is returning attention, returning awareness to yourself and training yourself to be happy with that. And this is called uh, mindfulness or sati sampajanya that we can all agree on our spiritual qualities. Other qualities like compassion, kindness, forgiveness, uh, all of these things, we should, as human beings, be able to recognize that certain qualities are good qualities. Then the question comes up, what are you doing to develop those qualities? If kindness is so good, what are you doing to develop the quality of kindness? Most people's answer is, well, I feed the cat. I'm doing my bit to save the creatures of this world. And when I get to Nibbana and St. Peter's on the gate, I can show him that I fed my cat for 15 years. Most of us here are not unpleasant people, but we need to be doing more. If you want to develop the quality of kindness, you need to make it more of an active practice, more of a way to, to make a statement to yourself that this is something that's useful. I don't know if you, you know, I've spoken many times, but of the yellow plastic buckets that people bring to temples. One time, when in my first temple, we were receiving these plastic buckets. This was my job during the Dutjin, which is the, the Chinese festival. And my job was to receive the buckets, uh, do the chanting and do a whole little ceremony. And then we put the bucket at the back and then somebody takes it back round to the shop at the front and it's sold to the next person, you see. And I felt a little outraged that we were, this was just didn't seem right. Until I realized that the Thai people knew what we were doing. And I was like, how do they justify buying a bucket, giving it to me, and I take it around and resell it to people? And they know what's going on. They're not silly. They're not blind. And so I asked this one man, I said, why, why do you do this? And he said quite simply that, if you're going to make a donation to the temple, which is what they want to do, instead of dropping money in a box, they like to take this yellow bucket, do a formal presentation with the chanting, the taking of the precepts, taking of the refuges, offering of the bucket. And then sometimes the people who have done it would even pick the bucket up and take it back themselves. So it's just the same as making a donation, right? But instead of just dropping it in a box somewhere, you make a very definite statement to yourself that here I am, I'm practicing this act of kindness and this act of supporting uh, the Sangha. So I was quite impressed with this and I've spent time since then that I make very clear if I'm going to do something good, I want to be very clear about it. The Buddha said that to get karma, for karma to work, you need to plan something, execute it with your own hand and then rejoice in it afterwards. Very different to a Christian concept, right? Christian concept is you should do it with spontaneously without people seeing you and then not think about it afterwards. In Buddhism, we want to remember our merits. We want to remember the good things that we've done to give us confidence in ourselves. This is part of the stabilization practices. So if we can agree that a quality is a good quality to develop, you know, kindness, forgiveness, all of these things, compassion, you can go to any room, any number of people, and pretty much you're going to come up with the same qualities, the same good qualities. Then this isn't Buddhism. This isn't 
Christianity. This is just being a spiritual person. This is just understanding that there are certain qualities that are worthy of developing, that I personally want to develop these qualities. Right? This doesn't belong to Buddhism or anything else. I may be a Buddhist monk sitting here saying these things, but in my mind at least, these things should be self-evident. I do see myself sometimes as a monk. You all see me that way, but I never really see myself. And then occasionally when I'm in the mall in Bankair or somewhere, I see myself in these long mirrors, these tall mirrors, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm not used to seeing myself that way. You know, the, the new monks, when I first ordained, they called me the flamingo. I'm not sure why. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes I get the shock that I, you know, I see myself. So these qualities and that we should be developing, it's important to, to enjoy it. As I said, rejoice in it, but it's important to enjoy it. Last week I mentioned this research that when people do exercise, if you tell them that it's work, they end up eating more calories afterwards. If you tell them that it's pleasure and just to enjoy it, they end up eating fewer calories. This is a, uh, some tests done by some psychologists. So it's the same with meditation. You're going to tell yourself that you enjoy it, tell yourself, and then want to do the meditation more spontaneously. Uh, it's the same with not eating. When I first went to the temple and I found out you're not allowed to eat in the evening, the first thing I did was uh, nip straight out and stock up on a whole load of toffees and all kinds of things like that. And uh, I was a layman. And then it took a while and then one of the monks said to me, you know, why don't you just not eat in the evening? I'm like, oh, I can't, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry, you know. And he said, well, we're all hungry. That, that's just not any different from you. You don't have a medical dispensation to stock up on sweets and toffees. Why don't you just consider it being light? You know, light weight, light in weight. And when I changed my attitude to it, it's like, you know, it is. When you don't eat, you do feel lighter. You do feel more energized. Those of you who have done fasting, I'm sure many of you have done fasting. I've done a few six-day fasts. And you, you feel a lot lighter and a lot happier. There's one person in this room has done a month fast, I think more than a month. He didn't get weaker and weaker and sadder and sadder. He got lighter and lighter. So very often, if you just change your attitude towards something, it'll be a lot easier to do and accomplish. As we come to these two strains of teachings, and one strain of teachings was emptiness teachings. And these emptiness teachings, actually in, in Buddhism there were three of the higher teachings. There were emptiness, desirelessness, and signless. Signless means you don't hold anything in your mind. You don't hold any particular image in your mind. So as you're sitting here, you don't hold the knee or the back. You don't hold a smell, a taste, a sight, or a sound. You don't hold anything into the mind. Also, desirelessness. If you're desireless, your heart isn't moving. These three practices were said to be different when you practice them, but the same when you accomplish them. Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness. This, was, this is an emptiness kind of practice. This is a practice that leads towards letting go, giving up, stopping still. And according to Buddhism, if you can just stop and let everything be, then things will start to unravel. Start, things will start to untangle by themselves. So Buddhism was a wisdom-based religion. This means we're using wisdom or seeing what's real and what's not real as the basis for our transformation. In India, there was a few kinds. You had Bhakti Yoga, which was faith uh, or surrender. You had Raja Yoga, the force of will. You had the Hatha Yoga, the balance. You had the Jnana Yoga, which is the seeing what is real from the unreal. And Karma Yoga, the purification by it through your actions. So the, in India, there were different ways of, different approaches to this path of enlightenment. Certainly within Buddhism, the path focuses on the quality of wisdom. If you can let your mind stop still and be, then wisdom starts to arise and things start to balance themselves out. You don't need to actually solve all of these problems, delve inside your head, fish out your ego, go to a psychotherapist, have years of therapy, analyze your childhood, analyze your brain type, analyze your gene expression, and 
come out, what you end up with then is a big folder, not wisdom. So, as we sit to do the meditation then, you sit and you say, okay, I will just be happy being here, being with the breathing. That's all we need to do. Is that what happens when you sit? <laughs> I saw a good cartoon a few days ago and there's a guy in a hospital and he has bandages around his head. He's had brain surgery and the surgeon is standing next to him and in his hand he has one of these little toy monkeys that claps cymbals. And the surgeon is saying to the man, we found this in your head. <laughs> That's probably more like what you experience when you do meditation, right? Why is your mind a mess when you sit down to do meditation? It's worth thinking about. Why, why can't you just sit and be? I remember looking around the monastery and I always thought, you look at the monks and a lot of the old monks are there, they can just sit and be. But all the younger monks, you know, they're scratching and they're changing position and they're checking their watch and taking a selfie put on Facebook. And Why can't you just sit still? Why can't you just be and be happy? And I'd look around the monastery and I'd look for the best meditator. And out of the whole room with all these monks and nuns, you know, the best meditator was called Stan. And Stan was this cat. And Stan would just go and sit. You'd just get a beam of sunlight would come through the window and Stan would just sit. I would be perfectly happy. I thought, I, I want to be like Stan. You know, not so much on the wisdom front, but he can meditate. <laughs> so why can't your mind do that? Because of the way that you've trained your mind. If you are always looking for some kind of stimulation, that's your habit. Stimulation with things that you like things that you dislike, or things that you feel neutral about, but will suck your attention away from yourself. These three, greed, hatred, and delusion. You've spent nearly all of your life caught up in engaging the mind with some kind of stimulation. So of course, when you sit, the mind's not going to stop still. The mind's not going to be beautifully peaceful. Do you want the Thai soldiers to return you some happiness right away without having done anything without having earned your dues. In uh, Christianity, they, they used to talk about this uh, trials and consolations. You've got to be willing to go through the trials, the emptiness, the dryness, the kinds of suffering, and then every so often God would give you this consolation. Consolation being the, the bliss or the happiness that comes up as you start to bring the mind inwards and still again, the way that it should be. So, this uh, process then, you can expect the mind to get a little bit tired and a little bit sleepy. You can expect that, the, that first of all, when you do the meditation, you're going to have a lot of thinking. Because you've engaged most of your time with thinking. As you learn to sit for a little bit longer then, the thinking starts to slow down. And then you get the sleepiness arise. You can expect to get the sleepiness. This, this doesn't mean that you can't meditate. right? Anybody can meditate. Not everybody wants to. Not everybody is interested. You hear about putting an end to desire. Many people, their hearts don't respond. I think we'll always be a niche market. I don't think Buddhism was designed for the mass market. But anybody can do the meditation. It's just like learning Thai. Anybody can learn Thai, right? If you've been here long enough. <laughs> it's not that hard, really. When I came, I, wanted, I really wanted to learn Thai. I lived in a monastery and the abbot was the only one that could speak Thai and I was terrified of him. Sorry, he was the only one that could speak English and I was afraid of him. I didn't like to, to talk to him too much. And so I wanted to talk to the people around me. So I learned Thai. I wanted to know what are these Thai monks talking about. Yeah. Then I, after I learned Thai, I realized they're talking about prices of things or food. So it was one of these two things that Thai people are talking about. Anybody can learn Thai. Not everybody is going to be a natural. It's the same for meditation. You know, when you sit down, your mind isn't going to stop still and be beautiful and peaceful and bright and shining. And alert. You haven't trained it that way. You've got to earn your dues. So you can expect the thinking to come up. The next thing that comes up is sleepiness because the mind thinks, well, you know, if I'm not doing anything, 
I might as well catch up on 40 winks. And so he starts to fall asleep. Then the next stage is, is even more interesting because you get the thinking and the sleeping at the same time. <laughs> it's almost like you go into a dream state and you're not thinking deliberately. You're kind of just bobbing from thought to thought to thought without really being engaged in the story of your thinking. I'll be talking more about exactly what thinking is and how to deal with it in meditation, I think next week or the week after. So there are these different kinds of practices, and I know that many of you have done meditation. Those of you who've done yoga, you know, you've done your bending and your twisting and your tying up in granny knots. And as you get better at the yoga, sooner or later you're going to have to come to just sitting and learning to be with the breath. You don't need to keep moving. If you're moving, it's easier to concentrate. That's why we have the walking meditation also. But sooner or later, you're going to have to learn to just be with that stillness, that brightness of the mind. As you bring the attention in bit by bit, you start to differentiate between the times when you're wakeful and the times when you are not wakeful. So as you sit there and you're like, okay, watch the breath in and out, and in and what's for dinner and out. And I'm sure, oh, I could get pizza again and out and in. Did I turn the stove off before I left out and that guy next to me is really scratching you know, has he got fleas and then the mind starts to go and you realize that most of the time you spent just caught up in thinking catch it oh, okay shake shake yourself down come back okay i start meditating now and then within seconds you're off again and you start to realize that most of the time you're not really even aware of yourself you're caught up in something, you're lost in something. So this differentiating between when you're here and when you're not here, when you're present and when you're not present, this is as the meditation starts to get good. It's not a case of absorbing into your breath and that's the only thing that you know and you lose the sense of your body and you start floating in the air and somebody rings the bell and you say, no, leave me in my, my cloud-like state. What we should be doing is focusing on this quality of wakefulness. It's as you realize the mind has wandered away and you bring your mind back. That's wakefulness, that's mindfulness. I used to do this early on in my meditation because in the monasteries, you know, meditation is just like boring and endless and we have all these all-night sittings and these morning, you know, two-hour morning sessions and all you can do not to, you know, end up with your nose on the floor in front of you. And so as you get used to it, you get used to just letting the mind wander and drift around without really being awake. And then every so often I shake myself down and say, right, I'm here. At just this moment, I'm here. Not in the creepy Freddy Krueger sense. The sense of you remembered yourself. So then you realize the meditation is less about absorbing into your breath, less about creating a particular mind state, and more about just this sense of being here. As you're here, you can see your thoughts come and go, but you're not attached to them. You can see feelings come up in the body and disappear. You can see your knee scream at you for attention and then just give up and stop aching. You start to see all of these things because you yourself are here and you're willing to be present. You're willing to be awake. You're willing to just be with the breathing. The mind will take on the object of whatever it is that you are holding in the mind. If you think about war, these places around the world, your mind is going to become despondent or angry. If you think about fluffy kittens, your mind is going to become a little bit more caring and kind, right? So whatever you put into the mind, your mind will take on those characteristics. Right? So if you put into your mind something that's neutral, after a while your mind will become calm. This is why usually we use the breathing as the focus of the meditation. But you can give up even that when you can distinguish when you're present and when you're not present. Then you start to wonder, you know, like all of my life I'm not present. I'm like wandering around in some kind of cloud. Outsiders look at us monks and think all we do is we sit around in these blissful states, divorced from reality. And we think the opposite. We think that we're actually, we're the ones getting back to reality. We're the ones getting back to this bright, vivid awareness of ourselves and what we're doing and how our mind is working. 
So this is how we start to develop the meditation. And I know many of you here have done meditation at some point in the past. Uh, maybe you've done a yoga course or a yoga teacher training course and they made you do the meditation. So. And then you, you look back on that time, you're like, you know what, that was a good time when I was really doing my meditation. Some of you have done martial arts, some of you have done Christian meditation. You've had times in your life, right, when you actually did it, you actually were doing the meditation. It doesn't really matter that it didn't seem to be going very well, that your, your mind seems to be wandering here and there and not getting focused. It doesn't matter so much when you look back on it, you're like, okay, at that time, I was taking a piece of my daily life out just to sit and be. And whatever the state of mind was, that was a beautiful thing. That was a special time, you know, in my existence. So, so I always recommend at least 20 minutes a day just to sit and train yourself. Don't worry whether it's good or bad. It doesn't matter if the mind is really settling down or it isn't. The fact is that you've sat and you've started to pay attention and value this quality of mindfulness. If you don't value it, it doesn't really come up. It's not going to be there in your life. It's not going to be close to you. If you value it, then it starts to be aroused all by itself. And then you find mindfulness coming up by itself, even at times when you weren't expecting it or you didn't want it there. You know, this mindfulness starts coming up and starts showing you things. But I'd rather those things remain hidden sometimes. So this is one strand of the meditation. But I wanted to give you the actual instructions that the Buddha gave to his monks and see how you get along with it. Okay? <clears throat> so if you settle yourself into a meditation posture, monks endowed with this noble virtue, with this noble restraint of the senses, with this noble mindfulness and alertness, seek out a secluded dwelling, a wilderness, the shade of a tree or a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave or a funeral ground, or even a heap of straw. After your meal, return from your arms round. You sit down with your legs crossed. Hold your body erect and establish mindfulness in front of you. Know that this body exists just to the extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness, abiding detached, not clinging to anything in the world, knowing there are these feelings, liking and disliking, just to the extent necessary, just for knowledge and mindfulness, and you abide detached, not clinging to anything in the world, knowing this mind exists, just to the extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness. You abide detached, not clinging to anything in the world. Knowing that these Dharma principles exist, just to the extent necessary for knowledge and mindfulness. And you abide detached, not clinging to anything in this world. Abandoning desire with regard to the world, he dwells with an awareness devoid of covetousness and desire. He cleanses his mind of desire. Abandoning ill will, he dwells within an awareness devoid of ill will, sympathetic for the welfare of all well beings. Abandoning sloth and tiredness, he dwells with an awareness devoid of sloth and tiredness. He's mindful, he's alert. He is percipient of light. He cleanses his mind from this sense of tiredness. Abandoning restlessness and anxiety, he dwells with the mind undisturbed, with his mind stop still. He cleanses his mind of restlessness and anxiety. Abandoning uncertainty, he dwells, having crossed over uncertainty, with no perplexity, with regard to what is a skillful or an unskillful quality. 